So, first of all, I'd like to start with Melanie, because Melanie, you've been in Israel until yesterday, mm -hmm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you live in, in Jerusalem. So if you could just paint a picture for us about what it's been like these past hmm. two weeks, two and a half weeks mm -hmm. in Israel, what mm -hmm. the country is like, how you've felt, mm -hmm. uh, and just paint a picture about what's, what's been going on from your point of view. Yes, well, let me start with a little snapshot of that terrible day, uh, Simchat Torah, uh, just two and a half weeks ago. Uh, Joshua and I were going to shul, it was Simchat Torah in Jerusalem, and it was 8.15, and we were walking down the street, and the air raid siren went off. And we looked at each other, and we said, huh, Hamas, up to their usual tricks. One of their rockets got lost. And then we heard the bang as the Iron Dome went into action, and we saw the trace. It was actually quite close. And we said, what should we do now? And we went, we went to shul. Elsewhere in the city, in another shul, that same siren went off at 8.15, and they had just finished a certain part of the service. There was an early service going on. And as soon as a particular young man in that congregation heard the siren, as soon as he heard the siren, he took off his talit and he ran. He understood what was required, and he understood that he would be called up immediately. For the rest of that day, we were, you know, we were in shul. News percolated into the service. The service was cut short. News percolated in that something terrible had happened in the South. We had no idea what it was. Those of us who don't, who observe the Shabbat properly, I mean, um, uh, with, with all due respect to the rules, um, we didn't find out what had happened until that evening. But some people had, just like the Yom Kippur War, some people actually um, understood what had happened. And we were told um, that um, it was a very serious situation in the South. And when we turned on our televisions that evening, we would be amazed by what we saw. So the situation was that that terrible day and the day after and the day after, I would say the Israelis were in total shock. Total shock. You have to understand, as I'm sure you all know, Israel is a very small country. I don't think there's a single family that's not touched personally by this. Either, they've had, either they had and were experiencing that day relatives who were being murdered, abducted, tortured, and all the rest of it, or they had relatives who were being or had been taken hostage, or they didn't know what had happened to their relatives because they just vanished, or they had children who were already in combat. I was told of one young man who was going to get married uh, on the Tuesday after the attack. And as soon as he heard what happened, he rushed out of shul, he rushed into his car, he had friends in one of these kibbutzim on the border, he rushed down to the kibbutz, he found a scene of utter carnage, and he found terrorists all over. He killed many of them many of them, he was wounded, he collapsed, and he was found in a kind of semi-conscious state by the IDF who finally arrived, and they very nearly shot him because they thought he was a terrorist. And somebody then said, he's wearing tzitzit, and they didn't kill him. In the days that followed, two things happened. People went into shock and grief and trauma. People have been going to funeral after funeral after funeral after shiva after funeral. The numbers are enormous relative to the population. At the same time, um, there's been such a tremendous feeling of everybody pulling together, everybody coming together. A, such a spirit you can't imagine. As you, as you all know, until this happened, Israel was such, so riven by internal uh, uh, fighting that you know, people were thinking there'd be a civil war. Overnight, not overnight, within the hour, that changed completely. Became one people again. One people fighting for their life, for the life of their nation, became a nation again. And the last thing I would say is, what's it like being there? It is absolutely terrifying. 
Um, you have this conversation in your head all the time. Am I going to be safer in the communal shelter? What exactly are they protecting me against in the communal shelter? Are they protected against chemicals? Are they protected against bombs? I mean, why will I be buried alive in the communal shelter in the basement? Would I be better off in the stairwell? And quite a lot of us are choosing the stairwell. So that's what it's like in Jerusalem at the moment. And, um, and yet you said earlier when we were talking that you wanted to be there, not here. Yes, I, I'm here. Uh, uh, I have to tell you that I'm not here because I love Jake, um, <laughs> although that is true. Um, I'm here because I have some prior engagements in America to speak. And first of all, there was a question of whether I could actually get out of the country. There's only one airline flying, as far as I know, which is El Al. Uh, everything else has basically stopped. Um, and I, but that wasn't the real consideration. The real consideration was, um, I mean, I have a, we have a daughter and grandchildren in, in, uh, in Israel, and we have a son and grandchildren here. Um, but the real consideration was, um, I didn't feel, I mean, being there is as I've described it. The grief is indescribable, it's communal. The terror is indescribable, it's communal. The national spirit is indescribable. But you f I feel that this is where I really am meant to be. Because uh, this is Jewish destiny unfolding. Whatever's going to happen, this is the latest seismic chapter in our extraordinary history. And I feel my place is there. So I decided I certainly couldn't leave the country. And then I thought, hmm. Perhaps I should, and then I thought I shouldn't, and anyway, here I am. And so I'm going to America, um, uh, I hope, um, and then I'll be back here for a couple of days on the way back from America, and then I hope to be back in Israel uh, uh, next week. Whether or not I'll be able to get back, it depends on what's, been, what's actually going on, what stage the war has reached. One thing that, that um, <clears throat> came to my mind as you were talking was some polling which was released just today, I think, or yesterday, taken from inside Israel that showed that levels of optimism amongst Israelis is, has actually grown since the war about the future of their country. Amongst Israeli Arabs, it's remaining about the same, about 31%, I think it was. But amongst the wider population, the Jewish population, it's grown significantly uh, uh, about their future, which has resonated with what you were saying about right. the spirit of... Decay. I'm not surprised. I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, it is... You know, the Israelis are the most extraordinary people. And uh, it's very hard to describe. I mean, it's, it sounds like a sort of trite cliche. We're all coming together and so on. But this, this, the sense of being buoyed up by this sense of everybody, you know, in this together, it's, it's, it's partly because so many people, virtually, as I say, virtually every, every family is touched by this in some way. I met somebody in the street. He has five sons and a son-in-law in harm's way, in Gaza, on the border, in the north. I met another man uh, who I know very brief, very vaguely. He, I said, how are you? He said, one grandson, thank God, he's injured. He's home, he's injured. Another grandson is, we don't know where he is. And he, 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 he cried in the street. People are crying all the time. It's, 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 it's an extraordinary experience. It's, it's life being lived there at the moment at this pitch of intensity you can't imagine. But the intensity has got its terrible side and its good side. Hmm. 